Starro is terrifying in this movie. Batman and Superman Battle of the Super Sons is a DC animated direct-to-video slash streaming film released in 2022. Although it did get a slightly earlier release October that same year at New York Comic Con, it got played there. Despite that, it feels like this film slipped a little bit under the radar, kind of came and went, which is a shame because it's very solid. This is a good little movie that would probably have done a lot better with some wider promotion. This because it's very well constructed, accessible, and most importantly for a film of this ilk, fun. Battle of the Super Sons is playing in a fan favorite era, one aptly known as the Super Sons, a time of teaming up between Batman's son Robin, Damian Wayne, and Superman's son John Kent. The idea is an update on the classic Super Sons, who while the concept of them debuted in the 60s, the firm realization of them and most of their adventures were in the 70s. Batman and Superman Jr. We did a video on them, I'll link it down below. They would have a handful of adventures in the late Silver Age and the Bronze Age, and a similar version would be played with years later in Elseworlds. But John and Damian were a new spin on the same idea, an update. Canonical legacy characters with their own more defined and distinct personas. These Super Super Sons had their own series written in 2017 by Peter J. Tomasi. Actually, hold on. Here it is, I can brandish it at you. <laughs> it had various artists, but people remember the Jorge Jimenez art quite fondly from this time. It was a strong hit with fans, though it didn't achieve the widest audience that it could. They would have a few forays over the years, the first lasting 17 issues, including the annual. This followed by a 12 issue series beginning in 2018. However, the Super Sons time was cut short when John Kent was aged up in the Superman pages by Brian Michael Bendis in the 2019 storyline, The Unity Saga, The House of L. This change is something that some fans have never recovered from slash gotten over. Many lament the loss of young John Kent and the stories and adventures he was having. DC has had stories that take place with the Super Sons, but they're casting back stories, looking back at a past time period. Some simply want John DH so that he can still be the same age as Damien, but most likely that is not in the cards. All of this is to say there is a definite audience for the Super Sons. There are people who know who they are and are excited by these characters. Some argue that Super Sons could really have taken off in the mainstream. And having seen this movie, I agree. It had a big potential to have a wide appeal. But again, and people have to know about it first. The movie was written by Jeremy Adams. Jeremy Adams has a firm grasp on writing family dynamics. It's been seen in full display in his Flash run. It's a fun, non-condescending tone and also has the story have stakes, but also doesn't veer into over-the-top melodrama. This movie, Battle of the Super Sons, walks the tightrope of presenting action and drama in a balanced way that appeals to adults and children almost perfectly. For at its core, this film is what could be deemed a kid's movie, though more than that's more of a family movie. Something that a lot of different age people can get something out of, while it skews a bit younger. Although in some ways it shies away from that, earning itself a 16 plus rating that it could have done without with a few minor tweaks that would not have harmed the film. So what is this movie about? Well, it's coming into a power slash heroism story for John Kent. It's his 11th birthday and he started to have some resentment towards his father for not being around as much as he'd like. But things start to make sense when John's powers begin to manifest themselves. And his father reveals his secret that he's Superman. John is elated and can't wait to dive into his father's world. He quickly meets Batman and his abrasive yet still slightly likable son Damien. The two boys don't get off on the best feet. Let's test that theory. <laughs> Damien. However, soon the two must work together to save their parents and the world. This one, Starro begins his conquest. Along the way, Damien learns a bit more how to play well with others, and John learns that being a hero isn't all fun and games. The movie has a very simple premise that one has seen before, but it's very well executed. Batman and Superman are very in character, and it's fun to watch them play off of each other. I told Green Arrow to check in with you, give updates. I haven't been able to raise them on comms. I'm suspicious. Well, that's not unusual for you. Even if one isn't up on their DC canon, so perhaps didn't even know that Batman and Superman have sons, this movie makes everything very easy to follow. And John Kent is very personable, a bit excitable, but not obnoxiously so. My dad is Superman? Like, THE Superman? This is the best birthday ever! Opening the movie with him as he comes to learn about his father eases newbies into the world, while for fans in the note provides an entertaining build up to the inevitable reveal. It allows you to not only learn about John, but see the type of relationship he has with his father, and as a result, get a glimpse of Superman slash Clark as a dad. <sighs> There's a fun Lois in this movie too. She's scatterbrained, but still gets the job done. Now this movie doesn't really go into why they keep Superman's identity from him, and for some that may rankle, but this movie isn't going for complex, introspective character drama. Instead, it's more action-based coming of age. There are references to deeper things, but they're brief. So there are nods that fans will appreciate, like the brief mentions of assassins or Raish. Although in the movie they call him Roz, but it's too late. I've said it before on this channel. Watching Batman the Animated Series first, it's got its hooks in me. That's 
That's just how I'm going to say it forever now. Now, non-comics fans won't know all of Damien's history, but this film will give them enough to go on, such as learning that he's just come to live with Batman and that he's been trained by assassins. It may even be enough to get people to want to know more. This movie also features things like the Bat Cow, which plays nicely against Damien's caustic persona for those not in the know and is a nice addition for comic fans. It's just one of those moments that shows there is an awareness and fondness for the source material. There are lots of little moments like that in this movie, like when they get to the Fortress of Solitude and there's the giant key. Some adaptations skip that and they're just in inside the fortress, but no, giant key that John has to struggle to live. Come on, live with your knees. Uh, I'm kinda new to this super strength thing. Another thing in this film's favor is that it gets a very good dynamic for the Super Sons. It gets it right, basically. Damien in particular is very well handled in this movie. The balance between his acerbic and violent nature with his insecurities and longing to be accepted is on point. What are you doing here? Aliens are taking over the globe. Come on, farm boy. We gotta go save our dads. This movie manages to achieve a harmony with his traits. He's even funny at points. I am doing something. I'm trying to fly away. You do something. You have heat vision? Just, just kill her already. I'm not gonna kill my mom. He comes across well, and it's very easy to take Damien to a place where he's not very likable. His character lends itself to becoming too bratty or psychotic or just hard to relate to, where the softer or more hurt parts of his personality that help round him out are buried or need to be inserted by the reader slash viewer. Here he's done well and bounces quite excellently off of John. Nope. Dynamic duo is Batman and Robin. We're super sons. Okay. You can see their friendship beginning to build up and you believe it. It also isn't just entirely easy on John's part either. He has to make a decision that he is going to try and befriend Damien. The plot, as mentioned, is very simple, but it makes the most of it. If you're gonna do such a simple plot, play in well-worn tropes and retread certain things, you have to do it well. And this movie goes out of its way to make Starro intimidating. <laughs> It raises the stakes of the movie, especially for younger audience members. It even gets a little scary at points, which is nice. It's nice to see these kids' movies going hard, like Puss in Boots and The Last Wish. Just sometimes you gotta add a little bit of excitement to it. This also works for older viewers or also comics fans who may have seen Starro come many a time. Starro even made it into The Suicide Squad. The 2020s have just been the time of Starro. As Starro says in this film, it is time. Having this version of Starro adds a bit of flair to the movie. And they also change it up a bit by having him emerge from the mouth. It's a nice element that makes things a bit more dynamic. Also, just in general, Starro and the situation the Super Sons face feels like a challenge, especially as they have to take on heroes under Starro's control. They do struggle to take them down, but for some, it's going to be a bit hard to suspend their disbelief that these two young boys succeed in taking down the likes of Superman, Batman, Martian Manhunter, and more. Although, hi, me from the future, it must be stated regarding stakes that when I watched this movie with my daughter, she kept asking me why there were evil Staryu and why the evil Staryu wanted to kill Batman. <laughs> Your miles will vary on how you receive this, over the top or fun escapist fantasy. How much you're willing to go along with it may also depend upon how much you're enjoying the movie. That tends to be the way. One is usually willing to give a bit more grace slash suspend more disbelief for an experience one is enjoying than not. The movie itself is 77 minutes long, shorter if you take the credits out. Those credits are doing their job. They're padding for the ages. But while this movie moves quickly, it doesn't feel rushed or like things are missing. It could have been longer, but it didn't have to be. It doesn't wear out its welcome either. Even short movies can feel incredibly long if they're poorly paced. With that being said, Star Wars defeat does feel a bit anticlimactic, but that's more in a how it happens than a pacing way. Star goes out a bit cheesily, especially after how intense some of the other presentations have been throughout the movie. I keep wanting to say film and movie just interchangeably, but film always makes me think high art. I don't know about anybody else. This movie was not high art. It was fun, but not high art. This movie does lay its breadcrumbs out very obviously. It's setups for what's about to be fulfilled later on in the film. This is one of the ways in which it skews younger. It's just very very, very overt. When Clark comes home talking about Queen Ants and Hive Minds at the beginning of the movie, and the villain has already been revealed to be Starro, most will be able to glean the climax at that point, and that is within the first 15 minutes of the movie. But for younger people, it may be an aha moment later on, or if one is just enjoying the experience, they may just enjoy watching John and Damien come to the conclusion. But again, this may be a bit too much for some. They may wish it was a bit more couched or a bit more subtle. This movie incorporates some elements of modern culture into it, and it does so quite seamlessly. It's a very little thing, but while John is looking for a birthday present in the house, he stumbles upon his father's costume under his parents' bed. And his reaction to it is this. Ugh, cosplay? 
This really works. Cosplay is a lot more common now than it used to be. Time of recording, it's 2023. They also bring this point back up when Robin shows up at John's school to come get him to help him fight Starro. That is the joke they go for and not the more adult joke, which is what they went for in action comics in 2023. Whoa, uh, mom, why did dad keep his... Hey, <laughs> were you looking for something, sweetie? Uh, board games? We keep those in the hall closet now. Oh my god. Remember when you went through your whole thing about personal space? I do. Again, this highlights that the film seems to be aiming younger, and the comics are apparently aiming older. At least I hope they are, because that's a role-playing sex joke. A funny one in my opinion, no kink shaming here. But it's definitely not for young kids. That point leads into one of the film's flaws, which is that while it is a film that is ostensibly aiming itself at a family-style audience, it makes some odd decisions, this in general surrounding how it presents some of the violence and random inclusion of adult, in quotes, language, aka cussing. The super sense feel as though they are built to appeal to a younger demographic alongside others, so it feels odd to make certain decisions that pull away from rather than leaning into that. Swearing in kids films is nothing new and it tends to happen a couple of times in some of the more higher rated ones to showcase that things are serious. Oh my goodness, they said a bad word. It's supposed to make things feel more hardcore or mature. Where funnily enough, if mishandled, it actually takes the maturity level down. The thing is, this adds an asterisk for certain viewers. Some parents won't like it and they may choose not to share the film with their kids as a result. Some, not all, but losing a potential audience in what seems to be your target demographic is never a good thing. Especially with so much else of the film seems to be tailor-made to them, and just by removing those elements, you could have a wider audience. If I swore as much as they did in succession in this one scene, I would be demonetized. For some adults, it may seem like nothing, who cares? But for others, it'll be the difference between sharing the film with their kids or not. The same may go for the level of violence that sometimes crops up in this film. Showing blood can be a very effective tool, especially in animation, where it's less common, so it hits a lot harder. Again, think Puss and Boots The Last Wish, just that one blood drop rolling down his forehead head. Super effective. However, this movie at times can go a bit hard in how bloody it gets. And again, this is something that seems to fit more into an older demographic. So this movie has a few moments where it doesn't quite seem to feel like it's aiming for the audience that the rest of the movie seems like it's geared towards. The story structure, themes, and the way those are handled and presented don't lend themselves to the higher rating. Now, in general, some may not take this film because they feel it's a bit too simple, and the beats may feel too familiar. Not enough new done. While others may feel, yes, it's playing in familiar tropes and with familiar characters, but it's doing it well. Another thing that may be hit and miss is the animation style. This CGI, almost Borderlands-esque kind of animation. The director is very excited about it, stating, yes, I have quotes, actually it was really fun to be able to see some CG with the classic 2D rendering come to life. I was happy to be a part of it. It was something that was a challenge. I know Rick Morales, supervising producer on the film, wanted to do, and I think it turned out great. Rick worked really hard with the designers to get those characters to look the way that they do, to make sure that they would emote and get some emotion and also be really interesting and wonderful looking. You got some great color, you got some great lighting, and the design was really fantastic. That's the testament to Rick's supervision. He did such a great job with them. They did definitely emote, but also at times the flow could look a bit stilted in certain motions, but not in the action scenes. The action scenes were excellent. Still, this style doesn't land for everybody. Let me know what you think of it down below. Something which was absolutely not stilted was the voice acting. Everyone's really good and gives it their best, and the characters have depth. The boys sound a bit older than they should on paper, but their performances make up for that. It's okay, Jonathan. I never liked this green cow ripoff of my dad's anyways. Come on, Robin Hood. I'm right here. Now, in general, there were some light controversies or non-troversies around when this movie came out that you may be aware of. I'll just briefly go over them, just touch upon them. These were the bigger ones. I know there were more. There always are. One was that Superman said truth, justice, and the American way. Another thing was that they did race swap Jimmy. Neither one of these things were really big factors inside the film itself. Superman says the line once. It's meant to align him with being a more classic, traditional Superman, which he most certainly is. You can really see that in the opening sequence where you see you're working with a lot of the old canon surrounding him. It's also meant to embody a positive sentiment of what the American way is meant to be at its best. I'm not American, Miles is gonna vary on how people perceive this. As for Jimmy, this isn't the first time that he's been race or gender bent. They just tend to pick Jimmy for that. Remember when Jimmy was Jenny in the Snyderverse and then nothing happened with that? <laughs> Jimmy plays a very small role in the movie itself. So how one feels about that is largely gonna come down to how one feels about swaps like that in the first place. All in all, Battle for the Super Sons is a really fun and well put together movie. It's a treat for fans of that era of comics and just for comic fans in general, but it's also something that's very accessible to people who may not be that deep into comics or that kind of lore, but just know a bit about, say, Batman or Superman and think the idea sounds fun. Inside of this film, there's a lot of love for the source material. This movie had a scary crypto, an intimidating crypto. How awesome is that? 
It's certainly not a masterpiece, but it does the things it sets out too well. It showcases the Super Sons, gives us a glimpse of Batman and Superman as parents, provides an exciting, if familiar, adventure, and leaves room for more. I, for one, would love to see more Super Sons movies like this. DC has always really excelled on the animated front, and this is a strong entry into that library. That's not to say that all their animated films are good, but when they're good, they're very good. But those are just my thoughts, and I want to hear yours. Do you agree? Disagree. The movie was hot trash. Did you see it? <laughs> Tell me everything down below. While you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe. If you enjoy what I do here, then please check out my coffee. Help support the channel. Perhaps join the memberships. We post some extra content there. I, as always, appreciate you taking some time of your day spent discussing comics or, I guess, adaptations today with me. And I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.